Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today is Josue Barone, and we're airing this show on October 21st, 2019. Josue was born and raised in Los Angeles, one of six kids raised by a single mother, which is often a recipe for trouble. Boys crave discipline, male role models, and examples of leadership. They also usually need to find a way to provide and protect, and that makes it easy to turn to gangs and crime to survive. But Josue is wired a little differently. In 2007, he chose to join the Marine Corps at age 17, and he changed his life forever. He served in Japan, Korea, Thailand, and the Philippines, and Australia before being deployed to Afghanistan in 2010. Exactly nine years ago today, on October 21st, 2010, Josue was on a morning foot patrol. On the way back to the base, his engineer stepped on an IED, and the blast hit them both and injured them severely. They were both left with amputations. Josue lost his left leg and his left eye. He received the Purple Heart and Combat Action Ribbon. Through his recovery, he drew strength from his wife and his mother, who never stopped challenging him to be stronger. He was also inspired by and inspiring to other Marines and veterans who had been disabled and continue to lead great lives. Now I want to take a second to invite you to support our favorite cause, which is Save the Brave. You can read about them at savethebrave.org. They're a certified 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to helping veterans cope with post-traumatic stress. You can read about them at the website. You can donate a few bucks you're not using. Pete and I both support Save the Brave with our time and our recurring contributions right out of our PayPal accounts. And Scott Husing supports them too, and he serves on their board. They do great work, and we urge you to support them as well. Josue is working with another organization that deserves our support. It's the Gary Sinise Foundation. And they're working together to design and build an adaptive smart home to make living with his physical challenges a bit more manageable. His current house has a bathroom and a kitchen that don't accommodate his wheelchair and stairs to climb to reach the second story. The house they're working on now will give Josue much more independence. We'll have a link in the show notes to Josue's page on the Gary Sinise Foundation website. We'd also like you to support the Break It Down show on whatever platform you're listening to us, iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube. You can help us out with a five-star rating and a positive review. It helps listeners find us, and we really appreciate you doing it, and we appreciate you listening and subscribing. And you can rate us and review us while you're listening, unless you're driving or operating heavy machinery, in which case you should keep up the good work and stay safe. This episode was recorded at Husing Ranch and co-hosted by Scott Husing, and as always, Scott and Pete go deep with our special guest today, a guy who knows a little something about digging deep. Here's Josue Barone. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbin. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> this is Josue Brown, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yes. So smooth, so easy. You are such a uh, a gold sunglasses wearing chilled guy. I'm excited to learn more about you because it's the first time we've ever met. We're here at uh, Rancho de Husing, hosting as always. Looking good in his, I wish it was a stylish burgundy jacket that said Break It Down Show on it. But I'm working on it. <laughs> and still in studio is the famous Chris Van Etten sitting in. Yeah. We're all homies here in beautiful. Handsome Temecula. soap model, underwear model. Sexy thing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, this is cool. So I guess give us some background so we can understand who you are and why you're here, because this is about to get crazy because your story is incredible. Well, yeah, I mean, so I I grew up in Los Angeles, California, in a small town called Cudahy, and it's one of the smallest cities in L.A., but it's 100, I would say 100 percent Hispanics. It's right next to Watts, Compton, South Central, East L.A., so it's a pretty bad neighborhood, a bunch of gangs, a lot of single moms out there, you know? raising a bunch of kids so that's one thing that connected me and a lot of my friends that uh most of us didn't have a dad growing up so it was one thing that we found with each other was man you know we can relate we know we're missing something at home but we can find it out here in the streets so at 14 i start me and my, my homeboys from the neighborhood we start our first crew so a crew is 
a step below a gang, but you're still doing the same thing as the gang, but you're not an official like gang yet. So it's a bunch of us um hanging out, just tagging, trying to create a a name for ourselves. And at the same time, now we're you know we're carrying guns. We're getting deeper and deeper into this crew that now we're fighting a war in LA with the big gangs. Hey, this is P. Day Turner from the Break It Down Show, checking in real quick to ask you this. John, Scott, and I all support Save the Brave with our time, our location, our effort, and our money. Each month, we give a small amount. Do the same with us. Go to savethebrave.org, click on the Donate tab, pick an amount that you want to come out each month, and they will handle all the rest. I stand behind these folks. Thank you so much. Let's get back to the show. We're getting deeper and deeper into this crew that now we're fighting a war in L.A., with the big gangs. How old are you? So I'm 14, 15. At the same time, I have so much respect for my mom that my mom has no idea what I'm doing in the streets because I, will cu- I had a curfew, so I'm over here doing my thing, you know, doing some crazy shit, and I had to be home by 12 because that's how much respect I have for my mom, you know? You're out gangbanging, tagging shit, and you're like, hey, mom needs me home by curfew. Yeah. So I'm like, man, this shootout better be at 1130 because I got to be <laughs> home by 12. That was the life that I was living for a while but at the same time i always had respect for my mom and she was raising six with me we're seven so seven brothers uh, six brothers and sisters so i knew how how hard she worked i knew everything she sacrificed you know my mom got came from mexico when she was 15 so when she got here she didn't teach us a lot about this country so there was a lot of things that i had learned out in the, out in the streets on my own and being in this little city called Cudahy in L.A., I really never got to understand what it was to to be a patriotic, you know, American or anything like that. So I lived in L.A. That's all I knew. You know, I knew my buddies were Hispanics and that's all I had. Just Hispanic buddies, no white friends, no black friends, nothing. And at the same time, we were fighting against other Hispanic gangs. So it was kind of like we're killing each other at the same time. And I reached the point in my life at 17 where I got to the point where I was seeing my older friends and I was like, man, like, it's not, this is not attractive no more. You know, like these guys are getting killed or they're going to jail for years. And at the same time, I saw how their families were based on what these guys were doing. So I always, you know, I always had a conscience in my mind and I knew that there was something wrong about this lifestyle. And I knew that there was more to this. And that's when one of my buddies told me about the army. Because once again, we didn't know there was a Marine Corps. <laughs> and um, my buddy tells me about the army. Uh, we get the army recruiter come to my house. He shows up and he, he sees five um, gang members sitting, you know, in the living room. And we're ready to take the practice, practice ASVAB. And all of us score less than 28 on the ASVAB score. It was like really low. And this guy's like, I'll call you. I'll give you guys a call. He left. We never heard from him again. And then my friend, after that, my that same buddy told me about the Marine Corps because I guess he had seen an ad on MySpace during that time. It was the Marine Corps. (laughs) And there was one in Downey, which is a couple of cities um, next to Cudahy. And we met one guy there who took us serious. He was an infantry guy. And he saw something in us that I guess we didn't know we had. And then from there, he took us serious. And we had a set date already um, to go. Well, we didn't have a set date, but we knew that it was that it was going to come that year for us to leave to boot camp. And one day, me and my four of my friends, that same guy, too, that told me about the, the military, we walked to McDonald's, which is two blocks away from my house. And we're walking, and this green Honda Civic, a 94, I remember, I, I remember everything like it was yesterday, a 94 green Honda Civic, pulls up next to us while we're, you know, coming back from McDonald's and shoots at us eight times. And then he sh- they shoot my homeboy twice. And those bullets could have hit anybody, but somehow two bullets hit him. And from there, kind of like his military career was, was over. From there, an opportunity came for me to leave like a month later. And I was like, I'm ready, you know, get me out of here. Did he die? He didn't die. He didn't die. He didn't die, but, you know, it went through his fingers and through the knee. But it was one of those things where, like, he had to do his own physical therapy and it was just, you know, 
they they weren't gonna take them anymore, maybe because of the physical, something um, something like that. We've had a lot of guys who have had this kind of lifestyle on the show. Yeah. And there's a common theme. One is that there's a lot of hopelessness or isolation like yeah. you had, like not even knowing there was a mm-hmm. Marine Corps, you know. Shaka Sangura said jail was an extension of the community. Yeah. Which is horrifying. He talked about getting off of the X without knowing that was a combat thing. He's yeah. like, wait, that's a combat thing? And I'm like, that's a combat thing. He said that most everybody he knew male-wise but that was older than him was either dead, shot, in jail, potentially all of the above. Is that in any way different than your experience? It's not, but for me, like at the end of the day, I can only talk about like my experience. You know what I mean? Sure. Because there's a lot of times where like I got injured and and you know, obviously that light I, I reached a certain point where that life is behind me, but I never in my life, you know, wanted to respect anybody who's still in my neighborhood. Sure. You know, who's still living that life and who hasn't experienced what my life has, you know, taken me to. Well, we don't want to disrespect anybody because yeah, because people choose their life yeah, yeah. and everything. But it's important to illustrate like what the reality is. There is that. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, this is what that community is like. No, no, that's that's the reality, and they accept that. You know, they know it. You know, and, and I always tell people there's a certain age. You know, obviously from 14, to 13, you know, to high school, where you you're still a kid, and it's like you can get away with some things like saying, "Oh, I don't understand this lifestyle." But once you start, you reach a certain age and you're still there, you've already experienced everything. And you know that in some way, this is not the right thing to do, you know? So a lot of guys understand that and they're like, hey, this is my life. I already have a record. You know, I'm not, I can't get a good job. This, this, is, this is it for me, you know? Yeah. I mean, throughout all the gangbang and all that, you're doing drugs, you're drinking. You know, you're just... that, that was one thing that, that I was smart about, you know? A lot of my friends were doing drugs, but I was always that guy who wanted to lead the group. And to lead the group, I always felt like I had to be sober and I had to be off drugs because I didn't want to be this guy who was smoking weed and feeling drowsy or sleepy. I'm like, nah, I got to be on my toes and I got to make sure we're okay. <laughs> so I was always that guy who wanted to drive people somewhere i was always that guy who was like let me be a leader so where where's your dad during all this and your i mean my dad family you know, brothers sisters my older brother's probably like six years older than me and he left with my my dad when he was like 13 to go work so he was already working construction and they were working in different states so uh, while my you know and then my brother not my dad was send us money <laughs> i mean like my brother was sending us this money to help out the family so that you know at a young age, I understood that my dad was, he was something else, you know, he, that this guy didn't take us serious. I, I asked that as a leading question because you say you don't do drugs, you're embroiled in this criminal lifestyle, this gang lifestyle. By age 17, you've been shot at and probably shot yeah. at more people than most Marines do in their entire career, sometimes spanning 20 years. And yet there's something in you, in Josue Baron, that wants to lead and wants to take care of his own crew, uh, which I think, again, puts you in that category as a protector, even in this totally separate sect of criminals, which the public would consider you criminals. You were doing criminal activity. I mean, there's this make no mistake about it. But even in that culture, you were a leader and you were taking care of your own. And through all of that, I mean, there was a turning point where you said, I have to to break away from this and you join the Marine Corps, which is our whole business as soldiers and Marines is to take care of others who can't take care of themselves. You've already learned that by age 17 and now you're introduced to the Marine Corps. What was that transition? I mean, I feel like I'm the kind of guy who in the streets, you learn how to be loyal and then having my mom, you know, teaching me a lot of these things, how to be humble and how to, you know, how to um, appreciate any little thing that comes our way because we didn't have it. I feel like it's what made me. And and I'm that kind of guy too who I, if I have a tight circle and these guys are willing to, you know, I've always had a tight circle. And if they're down for me, I'm 100% down for you. But as soon as you you make a mistake and you you, I feel like you you messed up because you wanted to and for your benefit, then you're done. And that's that's the street code. You know, that's the way it works in the streets. So then that's what prepared me for what's coming. 
you know, and I, I had no idea. None of this, like everything that's happened in my life, I've never imagined nothing, nothing. There's nothing that I could think right now that I would have in my life, like kids, a wife, being a Marine, you know, doing everything that I've done. I've never imagined it. And, and it's made me appreciate everything that I have because I never imagined having it, you know, and, and, and just feeling it, it makes me, you know, appreciate it. Yeah, definitely a lot of perspective. And uh, I, I want to share this right up front because we actually met at the gym at Fitness 19 here in Temecula. Did you smash into his car in the parking lot? I did. Lot? I didn't. Like <laughs> no, I didn't. I'm like, hey, who owns the uh, the Ford pickup truck outside with uh, disabled plates on it? No, that wasn't me. That was Chris Van Etten. He took oh, it Oh, congratulations. Me. I actually read about Hostway's story in uh, a book by our mutual friend, R.J. Bell. What's the title of the book again? Do you remember? It's After. My... After. Yeah, it's called After. After. It's a remarkable compilation of stories of veterans. And I'm working out. And I'm, you know me, Pete. I mean, everybody knows. Like, I'm, I'm a nosy guy. I'm a storyteller. I'm kind of, you know, I, I always ask questions. And so I pride myself when I see a guy who's a, a veteran. And he was just wearing, like, Under Armour. Obviously, he, he sticks out a little bit because he's got, you know, a Terminator, you know, prosthetic leg on. But he also has a Marine Corps eyeball, which has the Eagle Globe and Anchor on it. So, you know, I just go up to him, introduce myself. I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm a Marine, too. I like to know who all the Marines are in the gym. Just, you know, if you need anything, you know, there's a ton of Marines in, in town here. And we I should probably explain what you just said. You said <laughs> oh, yeah. like that's, so uh, you got to give some context as to what, how that's even possible. So real fast. We were talking about this. We had a big 30 person bash over here at the ranch on Sunday and Josue was over here too. And we were talking. It's cool because he's another guy that is comfortable explaining a lot of the nuances that people don't want to ask those questions like, you know, what does a prosthetic eyeball look like and how many? Hey, he's got a bunch of different custom eyeballs to, just to tell people what it's like and how many you got and all that. I mean, yeah, I've, I've always been that kind of guy who there's nothing that bothers me when people ask me, you know, like I, I like telling people what happened. You know, I, I don't mind going back into that world because, like I say, you know, at a young age. I've already, you know, had trauma, you know, and, and seen tr stuff like that. But to me, I like, I appreciate when somebody comes up to me and talks to me and says, hey, hey, what's wrong with you? You know, or like, what happened to you? This, this and that. And especially if it's another Marine, I'm like, you know, and that's when, when he started talking to me, you know, obviously he, I don't know if he knew about my eye or if he had seen the, in, you know, the logo in there, but on my left eye, I, ha I have the, the Marine Corps logo and it's part of my injury. But the prosthetic itself is, I mean, describe it. A lot of people think when you, they see uh, whatever, like Pirates of the Caribbean, and the guy pops his eyeball and says round thing, but it's not. It's No, no, it's kind of like a big contact, but a thick, a thick contact. So it's kind of like oh. a shell. I still have my eye in the back, but there's no fluid in there. And it's not, as, the eyelid won't open because it's not, it's not puffy no more. So it's just flat. Right. So that, that big the contact is what gives it that fills that void fills that that yeah that space and so this one had a marine logo on it but it's yeah. his favorite you were you were telling like my family and friends and 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 nick and his crew and he's i mean it's like it's like a haircut once you have it for a long time <laughs> mm -hmm. you're used to it and if i try to put a different eye and i look at myself in the mirror it takes a while for me to get used to that eye or even like going out in the street and talking to somebody i can't look at them in the eye with a different eye mm. like I'll start looking around and I'm like, I'm like, you know, I felt, I felt different. Yeah. So it's just one of those things where you have to get used to the eyeball and, and whatever's in there. Is it a comfort thing or is it an image thing that it, you, it's you, an image thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's definitely an image thing. Yeah. Like kind of like, Hey, I'm a Marine. Like, you know, if you need any other explanation, like check this out. Like, and most people who are Marines, obviously they're like, yeah, this guy's a Marine. And, and obviously I, I didn't have a lot of options. Like I wasn't going to put like a big LA, <laughs> you know, a big LA sign in there. I wasn't going to put like a gang sign or anything like that. So I just felt like the military eyes were perfect for this because, because I had seen, when I was at Balboa, when I first got injured, I was reading the Marine Corps times and I saw uh, Gunny Popovich. He got injured in 2004 in Iraq and he was missing an eye on the page. It said once a Marine, always a Marine, but it was like half of his face. Like, mm. you know, he had a Marine Corps eye. And that's where I got my idea from. I want to talk about that. Let's get back to RJ's book. I actually read the story and it wasn't until I met, we bumped into each other at the gym and then it clicked to me. It's like, oh my God, like I totally read your stories. There's a whole chapter about him in RJ's book. 
And, it, you know, from there, we just kind of hit it off and, you know, we catch some workouts together and he crushes my old ass into fine powder. And, uh, <laughs> you know, like I bust his balls cause like we're doing leg ups or something I'm like, yeah, but you only did fucking half man. So like I got to do <laughs> twice as many, you know? So it's like, but you know, still crushing me in the gym. And I think it, it, we, cause me and Josue talk about this and, and Chris is sitting here too smiling cause he gets it is you're continuing to inspire people and stay physically fit, you know, use all those tenets of, you know, basic Marine Corps fitness and mind, body, spirit, and whatever you're spiritual about, you know, we can talk about that for days, but you stay physically fit because it is really vital to stay physically fit. And I've admitted this to Josue because his story and, and, and what he's gone through is so inspirational to people. And there, he's, he said things to me at times where, you know, like, yeah, I don't feel I want to do this or I don't do this. I said, no, man, you need to do that. Like I, and I'll tell you personally, there's days I wake up and I'm feeling lethargic or I feel depressed and I think I'm going to be a puss today and I'm not going to work out. I'm not going to work out in the gym or I'm not going to work out in the pool. And then I'll see a feed and maybe it's Chris's, maybe it's yours. Maybe it's, uh, Pete Koch. maybe you want to go Pete, work out. Yeah. Jesus Christ. But all, you know, just those little seeds that you yeah. plant on this stupid thing called social media, which is kind of insignificant in the big scheme of things. Yeah. It helps, man. It really does. It just never know what you're going to throw out there of what you're doing. And people that have been through so much of you guys, people want to kind of know more about your life and they yeah. want to see more into your life because they haven't, they could never imagine one joining them, coming out of a gang, surviving that joining the Marine Corps and doing all of these great things that you've done and still being so fucking positive and so successful. And I, I, I will say this is that probably one of the things I've stolen not my criminal career, but recently from Josue is that something he said to me and I, and I, and it's his, so I'm quoting him, but we were out at a golf tournament for LA County Sheriff's department. And again, he just shows up. I'm like, I didn't even know you're going golfing. Yeah. He's like, yeah, I, I go, who are you golfing with? He goes, I'm golfing with you, sir. I'm like, all right, Roger that like hop in. So we golf that day and we're literally driving to the first hole. And we're talking about, being involved with Save the Brave. And, you know, we, we love having guys like Josue on the team because he knows all of us. He knows we're in it for the right reasons. They're not selfish reasons. And he said to me, you know, after everything I've been through and all the combat and the injuries and, and survival and this, he goes, I never want people to call me a hero. Just like Chris was saying, I want people to remember me in life for what I did after that. And I thought, I even said to you, I go, I got to write that down. And you go, whatever, sir. I'm like, no, it's seriously like it was really Great. fucking profound. And tell everybody why that philosophy is so important to you. I mean, because, you know, to me, every time I see somebody who's who goes downhill and who struggle, you know, who's going through the hardest time of their lives, but can make something out of it. To me, that inspires me like. It don't matter if you're missing a limb, if you're missing whatever it is, you know, but if you can go through through something so tough in your life, but make something amazing after that, you go through it, you figure it out. And then now you start thinking about the future and you if you can make something big, I'm not talking about like, just go get a job, go do this. Nah, I'm talking about like, if you can inspire people, you know, make a difference in the world, like to me, that's that 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 motivates me what's the one thing that if you had a message of inspiration to people listen i mean have you crafted that do you know what that one singular message is or are there multiple i mean I, you know i think i would just i would just say like it don't matter like where you come from like what kind of you know financial status you're in like there's always something for you you know like there's always something out there that you you can do that that you bring to the table so it doesn't matter if like if somebody's doing something over here or, or or over here you got some special in you that other people don't have but you got to figure it out you know and and it's, it's there but you got you got to figure out and sometimes you're going to go through some challenges and you're going to you know you you might not know it's there but those challenges are we're going to bring that special skill that that you bring to the table you've done a lot of things since your injury, since your time in the Marine Corps to inspire people, not just the fitness. One of the things you've done is there, at Camp Pendleton, just here in Southern California, Josue, and you can visit him on social media too. It's Josue Barone, 35, yeah. on Instagram. 
but there's pictures of you climbing up First Sergeant's Hill, which is this legendary ass-kicking hill that we climb for PT and it, these you know sadists run their Marine platoons up there. And at the top, there's a memorial for all of our fallen brothers at you know First Marine Division, and and it's an ass kicker. But you did it, and tell people the last time you did it and how you did it. I mean, I think it was one of our three five uh, reunions. So we had a we had a third battalion fifth marine uh reunion and I don't think I had ever been up that hill uh since I had been injured. So before we deployed, I you know, we were running that that was our backyard, but there was no crosses up there. Mm. There was nothing. So after our deployment, uh, then they started putting the crosses and then other units started catching on and everybody just started that they made that place into what it is now. So it was, it, I think it was like three years after we had a reunion and I was just motivated to go up there. I, I didn't even think about it. Like, I didn't even think about, you know, if it was going to hurt or if I could even do it. Like, I, I just wanted to go up the hill. So as soon as uh, I, I think just walking from the, from the parking lot to the hill, it's a walk. So I think as soon as I, I got out the car and I started walking, I was already tired. I was like, man, I'm already tired and I still had a ways to go to just get to the bottom of that hill. Then I was like, man, what I get myself into? But, <laughs> but I was motivated because I wanted to see the, the crosses and I wanted to get a feel. I wanted to see what it felt like to be up there. So as soon as I started climbing a couple steps into it, I'm a real high amputee. So I'm, I'm pretty much almost to like my butt cheek. So I can't really do a lot with this leg. I can't, I can't even pick it up. So as soon as I'm going up the hill, this is useless to me. It's just like an anchor. It just, mm. it just. He's talking uh, about his left it, leg. It just, right yeah, it's just, it just weight. So I had to take it off. I had to take it off. And now I'm like, I didn't even think about it. Like, it's probably harder if I do it with one leg. But I was just so worried about the leg being too heavy. And I'm just climbing it with one leg. I'm trying to go up the hill. Um, and it's probably the hardest thing I've done in a while. But I had to get up that hill. And, and at somehow, one point, you're literally low crawling up. Then. Yeah, yeah. Well, most of the time, I'm low crawling because I'm just trying to get up that hill. And I, if I get up, I'm going to fall back because it's a pretty steep, steep hill. And obviously, I had a couple good Marines there that pushed me, helped me out, gave me a hand when I needed it. And I eventually made it up there. But I had no idea that everybody else was watching because I, I thought I was just, I'm just focused on what I'm doing. And when I get up there, everybody's already up there and everybody's clapping. Like everybody, and I, I kind of want to give up towards the end because my knee's hurting and I'm just tired. My arms are just what they want to give up. But I'm like, as soon as I see them clapping, I'm like, I got this uh, second wind and I was like, hell no, I'm going to get up there, you know? And I get up there and they're clapping and, and it was it was a pretty special moment for a lot of the guys too because a lot of those guys that were at the reunion, they're not amputees, but they went through that tough deployment and I think just for them to see somebody like me overcomes that hill, I think it kind of gave them a different perspective. And for the new Marines that oh, have yeah. never been to combat to no, no. to see that and, and say like, man, when it's my turn, the yeah. impossible is possible. It, re it really is. Oh, yeah. Was one of the Marines that helped you up smart enough, like he brought your leg up with you. He's like, yeah, yeah, so, didn't leave yeah. it like, yeah. Because I my... can see the Marines doing like, hey, he's got my leg. I thought you had it. Yeah. No, I got it like that. Yeah, so like, yeah. No, no, definitely. He's got my pack. Oh, yeah. we left it in the LZ. Oh, you shouldn't have left it alone. <laughs> I think the Sergeant Major has it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. They helped me out. Got my leg up there. I put my leg back on. It took a shot of, of a tequila they had up there, and it was a good day. How was the kid back down? Was that just as hard? I mean, because now no, you're no, on the top. You got to yeah, go back. Log no, roll it? On the way back down. <laughs> they, on the way back down. Log roll. <laughs> on the way back down, there was some older ladies that were that had put on the, you know, that were part of the reunion. They drove up there. So I'm like, I'm not going down this hill. Like, I'm I'm done. <laughs> well, you wouldn't, you know? You wouldn't be able to, could I mean, you do I, it? I probably could have sat on my butt and just slid down all the way down, but. I was like, I wasn't going to do that, you know? Yeah. You'd have been picking sand, I mean, Mateo it, sand out of your ass for like a fucking <laughs> month, man. It, it, I had options at that point, you know? <laughs> I had options, and I was like, the best option is going to be this car here. And Did you task going. air for this show? I did not, but oh. we always have it. We always have air. That is uh, a section, a mixed section of Marine Corps air out of Camp Pendleton right now. They fly over this air corridor. Nice. Every day, yeah. Sometimes I'll signal them with my uh, cell phone and shine them. Mm -hmm. They'll tip in. Oh, <laughs> yeah? Literally. Yeah, it's it's nuts. So, yeah. It's the sound of freedom flying overhead. 
That's incredible, man. That hill story is, you didn't do it to persevere necessarily, but it became that thing. And then it also, again, like you were saying, Scott, with the social media thing, by just doing things, you know, with your physical condition, you get people to get up and go, well, fuck, man, if this way can do it, let me get up off this couch. Yeah, I mean, it was crazy because after that, like, I had people wanting to interview me. You know, I had the local TV box, and then I ended up going and Fox and Friends for that. And it was just like, I was like, man, out of this, you know, I was like, to me, I was just like, just doing it because I want to do it or because I wasn't thinking about nothing else, you know? And then it's like I say, like, I, I never expect anything. So when things come, I'm like, man, that's crazy. Like, wow, you know? Your humility and everything you do and the, and the people you know is, Josue is not a name dropper, but he knows so many people that, the same people we know too, but you'll never hear him say it. And like, your your humility is probably one of the, the things I admire about you the most, not being a Marine, we're all been Marines and going through everything, but you, you, as a person, your humility really sets you apart from a lot of people. I mean, in general, I think that's something that's really remarkable too, because you're also a really good listener. But I think that I love it when more people get to hear your story and, and talk about that. And, you know, talking about the injuries, one thing, and I, you know, I, I'm even fascinated too, because it, for those that don't know his way. So through the ID blast uh, in Afghanistan, it was 09, right? Was it 10? Oh, late, late 2010, yeah. In 2010 in, in Sangin, he got blown up. He lost a, you know, his, his left eye, his left leg, you know, almost to the hip. I mean, additional, you know, TBI and, you know, limited vision in his right eye. And, you know, his body's peppered with shrapnel. And, you know, he looks like, you know, fucking battle hardened warriors all tatted up. And uh, <laughs> I asked him, I said, how was the rehab part for that? Yeah. Do you explain it best to me about the whole? You know, yeah. I mean, I think the the rehab part for this was just my vision because I took shrapnel to both my eyes and now I got to wear uh, prescription glasses. But without my glasses, I'm kind of like, if I memor if I memorize a route, then it's easy. But if I got to go somewhere new, I'm like, if I, and I don't have my glasses, I have a hard time. But I think just my vision was the most important part of everything because I can accept losing a leg. I just couldn't accept like being blind. I couldn't accept like not knowing that I wasn't going to be able to see it, uh, anybody or, or live my life that way. So when I first got injured, both my eyes were hit and I was blind on both eyes. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. I can accept losing a leg. I just couldn't accept, like, being blind. I couldn't accept, like, not knowing that, I wasn't going to be able to see it, uh, anybody or, or live my life that way. So when I first got injured, both my eyes were hit and I was blind on both eyes. Oh. So it was a couple of weeks after that I started getting vision on my right eye. And little by little, it kept getting better. It was like a little hole that just kept opening, but it was blurry. And I had a hard time with the sun. Like the sun would just, I couldn't go outside. And after a couple of months, I reached the point where I ended up getting prescription glasses and it corrected my vision. So it gave me, it almost gave me a 2020. So I was, I was happy with that. Yeah. But the, the thing that was fascinating to me was the rehab of, of losing a limb and your oh, left yeah. eye. He, the way told me it was like, like his body, like a piece of paper. And I got my hands in there. I'm like sh literally like tearing a piece of paper in half. Imagine having your body just like split down the middle and that whole balance the whole coordination piece to mm, yeah, to right. rehab what you've been conditioned for you know for 20 years to relearn that was amazing yeah i mean just i think getting dizzy and not not you know not understanding that that a straight line is like this you know because my i, I can only see through my right eye so a straight line seems different to me like it's not it's not center anymore unless like, it was funny because I, I would take pictures sideways, thinking that, that this was a straight face. Mm -hmm. And it, was, it, it wasn't until, until I, I saw an ID and I was like, wait, let me do it again. Let me take that picture again. And then I moved my face, but I couldn't see right. I was looking this way now, but it, this was a straight face, you know? Yeah. So it took me a while to adjust. But like I say, I'm, I'm just thankful to be able to have vision on my right eye, be, be able to drive, 
you know, be able to be independent and tell the story where you, you know, dropped your glasses behind the seat. That was a great one the other night. No, nah, I mean, just, just, you know, just trying to, you know, just, just trying to like it's little I, I, things though. I, that... I was getting cold in the car and I was like, man, I need to put on my hoodie, but I have my glasses and I'm driving. It's like, it's four in the morning. I'm going to LA and I'm driving and I'm, I'm like, I'm thinking about it. I'm like, how, how should I, I can't take my glasses off and put on my hoodie. You know, how am I going to do it? So I'm like, whatever, I'm going I'm to give it a try. So I take my glasses off. I put them right here on the center console and I'm trying to rush to put on my hoodie and then I get stuck and I'm like, fuck. <laughs> and then I'm, I, I take it back out and I, I'm like, I'm put on my glasses real quick and I can't find them. So I'm driving and I, everything's blurry and I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm trying not to panic, but I'm like, whatever. And then I finally get them and I put them back on and I'm like, all right, I'll fuck my sweater. You know, I'm like, I'm not even going to put this on. <laughs> I mean, it's just little things like that, that comedy, but it's reality for me, you know? Yeah, that's that's the reality, but it's you know, people worry about distracted drivers. If you see Jose behind nah, you nah, trying to put I, his I, fucking hoodie on, like, you yeah. better pull over. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think I'm a good driver. You know, I, I think I've done well. Not when you can't see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I see Jose uh, Jose on the uh, on the freeway sometimes, and we, we we I've honked at him, I've passed him, I've called him because he's at one stage when he was running his business, he was very distinguishable on interstate 15 or the i5 when i when i see him in passing because he has this amazing business of dinosaur suits where they go to parties and he tows a trailer it's like a horse trailer but instead of a palomino in the back it's a little t-rex or a velociraptor and you see this dinosaur sticking out of the trailer and i text me like hey man i just passed you what's up brother but how did you get into that like you you know of all the crazy business to get into how, how did this one fall in your lap I think my wife, she's always been the entrepreneur one, but she wanted a birthday party for my kid when he was, he was only going to be one. And she was looking at these dinosaurs and she couldn't, she couldn't find anything local. She found the company in Houston and the company in Houston was charging a crazy amount just to come over here. It, was, it wasn't realistic. And we saw their dinosaurs, what they had. And I was like, man, maybe I should buy a dinosaur and like, we'll enjoy it for my kid's first birthday party. But then at the same time, we'll try to, maybe there's other families here that want this dinosaur too. Because to me, it was pretty unique. I was like, man, and, and it looks so realistic that I ended up buying one and I did what I had to do with it. But then I'm like, man, let's, let's make some money now. And somehow, some way we got a big gig with, um, we're like in and out. And I saw how much we got paid and I was like, Man, like we can make some money. Is this a suit that you put on? It's a seven foot suit and it's like 12 feet long, but it's a suit. And in there it has, it has handles. It has a camera and through the nose of the dinosaur, that's where the little camera is at. And you can, you can see in front of you. And then it has a little fan. It makes, it makes noise. It opens the mouth. It roars and it blinks the eyes. So it's pretty realistic. And then from there, that's when the idea just started coming like, oh, let's go do birthday parties. Let's go do this. How do we put it together? And it was just me and my wife kind of just building it from the ground up. And now you built it. You got a couple of them. You got guys oh, yeah. in the suits for you. And we, last time we were talking about this business, you were researching newer, better, lighter weight dino yeah. suits that are pretty badass. Yeah. So we've reached a point now where we're like, okay, we went from a dinosaur weighing 60 pounds to a dinosaur weight weighing like 40 pounds. Oh. So it makes a huge difference in the person that's in there. Like, sure. Cause it sits on your shoulders. And for a while I was, you know, I was kind of contemplating quitting because I didn't know what they were feeling. Like it wasn't like telling my brother, Hey, get out that costume. Let me get in there and let me feel your pain. You know, because he he would come out of the costume like hurting. And I'm like, man, like, you know, I couldn't, it up. I, I, but, I, but I couldn't feel his pain. So I was like, man, I don't know if I want to do this. So that's when we found that we're like, if, we, if I want to continue to do it, I got to do some about the weight, the weight of the dinosaur in order for somebody to be in there comfortable and not get hurt. Yeah. So we figured it out and I went from uh, one dinosaur to like four dinosaurs. And then we added some other stuff to the business, like a big egg prop where people could get in the egg and take pictures with, with our logo in the middle, a puppet. We added a dinosaur handler that goes out and plays with the kids and like ha ha have the kids dance all the whole time, you know, and kind of keep them happy because I felt like what we were charging, I wanted to make sure we were giving them the best, you know, like. That sounds awesome. 
Yeah. You know, veteran entrepreneurs, like your mind, the mind of a Marine or a sailor or any, or a soldier is like, if you go in to do it, you find a way to do it and oh, yeah. they can be successful at it. And like, that's, that's what I love about that business. And uh, let's talk about it because we're all neighbors and you're going to be a closer neighbor of mine now because Josue was involved in a, it, with, with a nonprofit that was signed on to build his home. And he, you know, we're working out and he's telling me kind of the trials and tribulations. We won't mention any names, but it just, they're saying, oh yeah, we'll do this. We're going to move you here. We're going to want to move you there. We can't buy this land. And he's, he's telling me this whole horror story and how painful it is. And he's, he was adamant about the fact he says, you know, no, my kids, he's got three beautiful boys now. They look like little mini GQ Josue's <laughs> because they all have these quaffed hairs. They're all gelled up. <laughs> always dressed to the nines they're adorable but they wanted to move me he says no temecula is my home I, this is one of the best school districts in the state if, if not the the country and this is where i want to live and so he broke contact with that and I, I remember we were at the gym working out and he says hey scott guess who called me yesterday gary sinise and which is again such a small world yeah tell everybody about how that whole thing unfolded and where you're at in the process and like how that how that's gonna unfold over the next year or so? Yeah, so we we you know we got we got accepted by the Gary Sinise Foundation, and what they do is they build adapted homes for uh, severely disabled veterans, and it's, you know one story home, you know, to make life easier for the veteran in a wheelchair or prosthetics. So we got accepted to them, and it took about a year, but finally the whole team came out and met my family talked about what we like to do and just kind of got a feel for us. And after that, we went out to go look at land and it was kind of like a kid at a candy store, you know, they're like, Oh, you know, do you like this, 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 and that. And, and we ended up picking five lots. And then from there, we just cut it down to one. And finally, um, last week we picked one lot and like two, three days ago, they made an offer on the lot. So, it's a two acre lot here in Temecula and hopefully build our forever home. Yeah, it's really cool. I mean, what's nuts about this whole story too is even before he told me this good news that they they put the bid in on the lot, I reached out to Josue and, and through other connections, Scott Siegel, he's putting on this great event at uh, Temple Batyam in uh, Newport Beach where Gary's going to be speaking on August 25th at 6.30 p.m. You can go to templebatyam.com. You can find the event. We'll put the link to it on, uh, it's on my page at Equin Ramadi. You can see the event. Josue is gonna be there. He's gonna meet Gary again in a very intimate VIP setting. Gary's gonna be signing some books and speaking. And Scott Siegel, who I was introduced through another friend, good friend of mine, John Gates, is the founder of California Closet. So I don't know if Gary puts in custom closets, but we can put Scott on the hook right now and yeah. just say, yeah, we'll need some closets for Josue's <laughs> home. And you're going to meet Scott oh, too. Man. He's a wonderful guy. And we were just in in Irvine Improv with Jay Moore. I took Scott up there and introduced him to Jay. And, you know, this network of people, again, willing to always help our veteran community and, and guys that care, just, it's a fucking mind blower to me, man. Yeah. Like, I just... The, the circles just continue to overlap, man. It's just, it's phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I feel like the circle helps everybody, but at the same time, like me, if I didn't have none of this, I, f I, I would feel like I couldn't go back to LA and help my guys, you know, the people who I really want to help that ha that are not military, that, are, that have no idea that there's a different world, you know? So I feel like everything in the military, me getting injured, me meeting the people that I've met, me the influences that I've had through my injury wouldn't have made me or motivated me to go back to my area and be like, okay, now this is what I know. Let me let me show you guys a little bit of what's out there, you know? How hard is it for you to pull yourself out of the house every day and and stay connected? Because we we've we've talked about this. It's not hard, but to me, like I like I say, um, I like surrounding myself with people who, who motivate me, who bring something to the table, who are hungry for their life too, who, who want to do something. Like I reached the point in my life where I, I, I just don't want to go out and have a drink and get drunk. And like, everybody's like tr trying to pick a fight or do this. Like I have three kids, you know, I, I have my wife and my time to me is, is valuable, you know? And that's the way I see it. I'm like, if, if I'm going to go hang out with somebody it's because, you know, 
I'm going to bring something to, to their table or they have something that I want, you know, and I'm like, I, I want to be like them or something, you know, something that, that inspires me. So, I mean, it's not, it's not hard, but finding the right people is hard. I was so happy though to you last Friday, you went out with Save the Brave on an offshore fishing trip. So, yeah. I didn't really get the after action report on that. Like how was, how was that being with the, with the guys with Save the Brave out on the Pescador? And, and you know what, you know you what? I landed some. I will tell you it's different because I haven't gone on a lot of trips, but when I did go on trips, when I first got injured, it was a lot of amputees. So a lot of the amputees get a different type of love. Huh. You know, they get a different type of love that I didn't want anymore. You know, I didn't want, I didn't want to be coming out of the airport and everybody's clapping because you're missing a limb or this, this and that. So being out with these guys here at, at Save the Brave, I feel like none of them had physical injuries that I can see. So is a little bit different. So getting to experience something like that is something that I like, you know, and, I, and I'm like, man, these guys, they have a different, better in life that I do. Like, obviously, and, and yeah, they're, they're, they have their disabilities, but it's a whole, it's different. So just interacting with somebody like that and kind of like surrounding myself with people like that is just, you know, and then they look at me, they're like, they get inspired and motivated. And I'm just like, like wow, you know, like that's, crazy well it's it's interesting too because when you can see the the physical injury or you you, you see another veteran and you know you could look at a guy like pete and, and you know you know if he's 100 percent disabled and you don't see and some say oh why are you 100 percent disabled like well, you know, well i don't know what makes me 100 percent disabled yeah would, would you feel more comfortable if i if i was missing a leg or an yeah. eye uh, does that make me a more disabled vet yeah. and i think people don't really understand that lens and i think that it was really cool when you said that is like you experience a different part of the veteran community because people don't just see oh man he's missing a leg like i just see again i just see the marine but when you're hanging out with all the guys on our team and all the vets we bring in from the la vet center to experience that i think what's been most important for me that keeps me doing what i'm doing is these guys aren't together complaining about their injuries complaining about the adversity they're not telling war stories. They're just connecting, man. And that is really what was is so powerful to me. And then when we bring guests out and, and people that are supporters and donors and they see that that brotherhood. John Gates called me today and, and Josue was over the party. John Gates came to the party on Sunday. Nice. And he sent me this lengthy, very emotional email. The fact that he physically witnessed this brotherhood that we have as Marines and the fact that it was predominantly Marines that showed up. John's a Navy vet and we thank him for his service as well, but he experienced that firsthand and it really became more real for him, even as a veteran. So I think that's really, I think it's really interesting. We don't often dissect that on the show or even when we're just kind of fucking off and, and talking about that. Yeah. Why not? You're the smart one. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things I've been trying to figure out is, patriotism seems to be kind of this ambiguous term. And I was told the other day that patriotism is a negative thing. And then I was told the same day that patriotism is a wonderful thing. So somewhere in the middle has got to be reality. How do you see patriotism? I mean, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm in the middle. All right. I feel like I'm in the middle because of where I come from. Like where I come from, a lot of immigrants. You know yeah. I mean, where I come from, like, like to see what I see in TV and then to see where I come from doesn't click to me because I've been there and I know like my mom, where she comes from, you know, I, I, I've seen it. So it's always been one of those topics where like, I'm just kind of like, I really don't talk about, you know, because there's two sides of when you're in the military, there's two sides. Obviously there's like, some guys who are really patriotic and this, this, and that. And to me, I don't like, I don't want to start no fights. You know, I don't, you believe in what you believe and that's cool. You know, it is what it is. But at the same time, I got to stand up for myself. Yeah. So if something bothers me, I'll let them know, you know, I'll be like, hey, and I won't, I won't fight with somebody or I won't tell them, hey, nah, you're wrong. You know, I'll let them know, you know, I'll let them know in a, in a clear way where like just to see if he wants to understand or if he doesn't want to. And that's it. But right off the bat, you'll understand people who want to pay attention and, and who, who would, you know, listen. Yeah. And people who don't, who already have their mindset, you know. 
but I would say that it definitely opened my world when I joined the military to like what being a, you know a patriot is and and understanding the love for your country, you know, and understanding um the the job that's out there that not a lot of people do. Have you ever experienced anything negative since you came back from from Afghanistan from the public? We don't often hear about that. I mean, we yeah. get, we got heavy doses of that from Vietnam vets. Have you ever experienced that? Nah, you know what? And and and, and even if you experience a little bit of it, I, I feel like it's nothing compared to a Vietnam veteran. So to me, it's like it's like compared to the love that we get, even just a little bit doesn't make to me doesn't bother me because there's just so much that people didn't have back in the day. So I feel like imagine just these nonprofits that came out of nowhere, you know, in the early 2000s that have just made a difference in people's lives. Like, we're so lucky just to have that. And just to be part of this era, I feel like I'm lucky. When you look at the moment right before your injury, if you were able to replace that decision, same outcomes otherwise, like, yeah. would you tell yourself to, like, stop, it ain't worth it, you know, and get your leg back, get your eye back? Nah, you know what? If If I could change it, I would want to give myself longer time in Afghan and then step on an IED the last day, you know, <laughs> step on the IED the last day. And because I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to change what happened to me. Okay. Because if, if I change what happens to me, then it, it, I won't be the same person that I am today. Yeah. So I would just give myself a little bit more time and spend more time with some people who, who didn't make it. And then, so I would say like, like blow me up like before we go to Leatherneck, you know, like that's it, you know, <laughs> like give it. me, give me some more time. Yeah. And that's it. But more time in a combat zone though. Let's understand yeah. that. Yeah. More and time. also that you like who you are now. Yeah. Give me more time in the combat zone and let me experience some more things that I'm missing. Do you feel like you didn't live up in some way to the Marine standard? I mean, you know, I, I feel like definitely it got cut short because because as a young Marine, I felt like there was so much leadership that I still, that was still going to come out of me. And I never got to, to understand that, you know, I never got to like be the Marine that I wanted to be because my life, my life got short. Um, my, my, my injury, you know, cut my career short. So I just feel that, that I could have been somebody real I could have been an asset in the Marine Corps if none of this would have happened. Isn't the Marine that you want to be the guy that climbed that mountain and made national news? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and that's what I'm saying. Like, that's what I say. Like, imagine the things that I'm doing now because obviously everything comes with, with your age too. Yeah. You know, you maturing. But imagine the person that I am today. I feel like there's a lot of qualities that I always had in me. But there's different challenges that sure. we're going to bring them out. And who who knows that... You know, who knows, maybe in my second combat deployment, you know, I could have been got something out of that and made me a different person. Yeah. Were you thinking you wanted to make the Marine Corps yeah, career? Yeah, I wanted to make the Marine Corps Sergeant career Major Barone. because I had nothing else in the world that I thought I wanted to do. You know, there was nothing else. I wasn't good at school. I wasn't good at, at other things that I was just like, man, the Marine Corps, I could make this my, my life. And I was OK with it. Like, I didn't want no kids. I didn't want you know i don't think i wanted to get married so i I was like this this could be it here you know i, I, I don't mind it sounds to me like you're a fantastic marine oh. like you did have a great career you were medically yeah. retired right yeah yeah so you had a career oh, you yeah. did great and then you're a man of faith i'm assuming yeah yeah I mean, so it sounds like god's like that. hey that's great i don't need the desperado guy the guy who doesn't yeah. feel cold and rain all that kind of i want you to feel love and have kids oh yeah i mean but but i'm okay with both um, yeah. avenues you know wherever i'm okay with where i'm at now you know and and a lot of the times a lot of people say you know what if this this like i don't think about what ifs you know yeah, I, don't, I don't think enough. about what could have happened i don't think about there's nothing that that hunts me there's nothing that bothers me the only thing i'm I'm thankful for in, in, in life is that i never kill nobody in la you know that's one of the things that i'm thankful it's like you know a lot of people are happy about this this and that and i'm like to me i'm i'm thankful i never kill nobody and that's probably one of the things that would bother me for the rest of my life if i if i go back to my mom's house or i go back to my neighborhood in la and i know that i kill somebody in the street yeah. you know like to me it's like I, 
I could live with it, but it bothered me. I can only imagine how proud your mom is of you right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I became the, the outlet to my family. Like my two sisters and my older brother, it was real tough for them to get their citizenship and to get all this. Sh and they have been, they've been here since they were five, four years old. And now my brother's 35 years old. So as soon as um, I got injured, I helped my brothers get their citizenship. So I was that outlet for them to like, oh, you know, now you got somebody in the military that got injured, Purple Heart and this, this and that, that makes a little better income now. You qualify to help them out. And I felt like my whole life, that bothered me. So if I was able to close that and give them their freedom that they should have had a long time ago, it closed like a gap in my life that I was, it, it kind of closed like a scar in my life that I had, you know? Yeah. What's the next mission for you? I think acting for Marines is huge. You know? Like for me, I want to be a stunt guy. <laughs> like, because I like I, I've done two stunts already. I did, I did a movie with, uh, with Jennifer Gardner. It's called Peppermint. And I was one of the, the stunt guys for a fighting scene. So that to me, I was more attracted with that because being uh, like the guy, the Navy SEAL that got me that job, uh, he's a stunt coordinator and he had, he's, done, he's been do doing it for like 25 years. And he just told me, he's like, man, you know, being a stunt guy, you get paid well, you do your job and you're out. Like you don't got to sit there and wait and do this, this and that. You do your stunt and you're done. So I was like, all right. Can you ride a horse? I could ride a horse. If, all yeah. right. That's you a know? good one. If you can ride a horse, you can work. I could ride a horse, but there's a lot of like, for somebody like me who's Hispanic, you know, there's a lot of gang related movies. You know, there's a lot of um, military movies. So I feel like I fit a lot of the, the categories that are out there. And to me, if I could do something like that, it gives me freedom, you know, and I can still spend time with my family, my kids, and just get called to do whatever I got to do. And, and then obviously my dinosaur business, um, you know, and, and whatever comes my way. Like if I see an opportunity and there's money to be made, then I'm going to take it. Is there a show or a type of film that you want to be on that you, you think, man, I, if, if I can only get in with that show? Yeah, I mean, I want to be in a war movie. I want to be in a war movie and, and I, I want to be, you know, I don't mind getting blown up again and going through the whole scenario again, but I want to be dramatic about it. <laughs> you oh, can yeah. be really? guy who gets you know? his leg blown off in every movie. But, like that could but, be your type. No, but like I, West, I, dude, he's, he's always the Indian chief. <laughs> like. No, but, 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 but I want to be um, that guy who, you know, you know, in your mind, when you get blown up, you picture there was so much shit in my mind that I still could have done. Or not, not that I could have done because obviously my body didn't let me. But I wish I could have done. Like, I wish I would have been that guy without a leg, crawling to get my rifle, killing a couple more guys, and then putting my own tourniquets, you know, and then, like, just going above and beyond. So if I could get a movie like that. That's what you want? That's what I want. You know, just kind of like, you know, give me the hero that in my mind I wanted to be, you know? Well, let me tell you, man, you're the hero that you are. Yeah. And it's yeah. pretty fucking good. I, I like it. Sitting sitting here with all, all you guys, Chris Van Etten and... Josue Barone and and everybody that comes on the show that says they're not a hero and I, you know I love I'll give Rudy Reyes a shout out because he wrote this great book Hero Living and he embraces his hero and he, he says even as a young boy I, I found my first hero moment where I helped my mom get out of that abusive household yeah. and how I pulled myself out and I think we're such humble creatures as Marines privately in public no one accuses us of being that way because we're a bunch of braggarts but uh i think individually i think that it, it is a tough thing to say that yeah i'm, I'm comfortable in, in in saying i've done some heroic stuff and i love absolutely your philosophy of your vision and philosophy of heroism is not what you've been through not what you've done but what you're capable of doing and 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 what you're going to leave behind and, and you've impacted so many people in your life now, I think that, you know, when we do another episode with you on and see how you're jumping off of buildings or getting blown up in war movies or what, whatever it is that you're going to do. I think in five or 10 years, we're doing episode 5,000 of the break it down show. I mean, I can only, I can only imagine the lineup and hearing the, the success stories. And, and I mean, seriously, how old will we be Pete? And these guys will be our age then. So be geezed out. But I, I hope that's to come, man. But if you want to find you on social media, where do you want, where do you want people to find you? I just have Instagram. I don't like Facebook. I don't like nothing else. Uh, so you, on Instagram, you can find me at Josue Barone with a double R. Josue Barone 35. 
And if I want to rent a T-Rex for my kid's birthday down in the San Diego area. So you could go uh, to American Dinosaur Events. Either either on Instagram, you, you, you type in American Dinosaur Events, or we have a website, you put AmericanDinosaurEvents.com. We got to hook you up with the guys at the mat. Yeah. It's perfect. Oh, my God. Yeah, the San Diego after museum. So, yeah, it was a great, great interview, and uh, thanks for coming to the show. Yeah, thank you, guys.